This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. A postcard from Anaheim, California. August 6th, 1970. The riot cops were out in force as Don colored Sleeping Beauty's castle. They were prepared for an invasion of Disneyland. Flyers had been appearing seemingly out of thin air for weeks. Under windshield wipers tacked to telephone poles, wheat pasted to the walls outside record shops. They said the Yippies were coming. The Youth International Party, founded two years before by Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin to protest the war in Vietnam, and now Cambodia. With the belief that politics and mass media and capital had hypnotized the masses, had made America complacent and compliant with the ruling order that was leading it to its destruction. And with the idea that they could subvert that order with dramatic protests and street theater and surrealism and drugs and pranks that would disrupt the routine in the road, that would punch through the screen of illusions that allowed the powerful to stay that way and would shake people out of their passive acceptance of their lives as they were in a war no one wanted. And so the Yippies rained cash down from the gallery above the New York Stock Exchange and brought the center of global commerce to a halt, if just for a moment, while traders on the floor looked up, wonderstruck, and tried to catch each flitting snowflake till the bills landed on the ground and all was scrambling, grabbing chaos. And so they'd marched on Washington and surrounded the Pentagon and tried to levitate the building with a kind of magical thinking no more absurd than some of what passed for sober planning inside. And now the Yippies were calling for a happening in the happiest place on earth. We're better, they thought, to make a statement about conformity and corporate entertainment as the handmaiden of authoritarianism and the corrosive fictions of American history than the place where animatronic slaveholders held court at the Hall of Presidents where guests could play out their genocidal fantasies at the shooting gallery in Frontierland, or at a cavalry fort forever beset by Red Indians at the center of Tom Sawyer's Island, in the center of Disneyland, in the center of Orange County, the Republican stronghold, the Nixonian homeland. And so there would be a yippie powwow, that's what the flyer said, a protest featuring the liberation of Minnie Mouse from her male oppressors, a cadre of Black Panthers serving breakfast at the Aunt Jemima Pancake House, and a ritual barbecuing of Porky Pig, who wasn't a Disney character, but the Yippies were the last people to let intellectual property laws stand in the way of a decent joke. By the eve of the powwow, rumors and news reports and law enforcement intel predicted some hundred thousand radicals would descend on Disneyland and lay siege to the Magic Kingdom. And management at Disneyland and the Orange County and Anaheim Police Departments had watched the 1968 Democratic Convention when the Yippies led a protest and threw a free festival in Lincoln Park in Chicago. And next thing you knew, there were cops cracking kids in heads with batons on national TV. There had been riots near UC Santa Barbara earlier that year. In one of them, college kids burned down the Bank of America. In another, a cop had shot and killed a student. And no one wanted that. So the police trained in crowd control and riot suppression. Phalanxes of riot cops practiced corralling maneuvers in the parking lot. A mobile hospital was set up, a courtroom for processing arrests, a jail to contain the arrested. Positions were mapped out for marksmen on the roofs of restaurants and souvenir shops. Orders were issued to Disney employees. Managers would go undercover as tourists. They would carry walkie-talkies hidden in shopping bags. Some would wear long wigs and fake mustaches. Ticket takers and cotton candy makers and sellers of mouse ears and ride operators would be the eyes and ears of the operation, calling out anything suspicious, raising the alarm at the first sign of trouble. The only workers who weren't deputized were the costume characters. Because who knew what would happen if the pinkos caught wind that Goofy was a narc? And no one wanted children scarred by the sight of Dopey or Dumbo or Bashful getting beat down by some dope fiend. But morning came and the sun rose over the snow-painted peak of the Matterhorn, glinted off the chrome of the track-bound roadsters of Autopia. And the 100,000 predicted longhairs turned out to be a few hundred tops. Instead of a flood, the kids came two by two, in buckskin and fringe and hip huggers. And the few hundred police with billy clubs and shields and masks stood down. And the few hundred and 25,000 other park guests spent the day at Disneyland. Walked up Main Street, 
the soda fountain, the magic shop, the old open top Ford with the horn you squeeze with your hands to make it honk, all designed to evoke the Marceline Missouri of Walt Disney's childhood. White sidewalks, white fences, white America idealized, mythologized, circa 1910, way back when, though it was barely 45 years before the park opened. But two world wars and highways and jumbo jets and the A-bomb and the H-bomb and satellites and Jim Crow lately on the run could warp one's perception of the passage of time. There was shouting, some name calling back and forth between the freaks and the squares, but very little came of it, which bothered some of the yippies. That their mere presence didn't set old ladies fainting. That this sight of some twenty-somethings pretending to be snakes on the ground at the feet of the barbershop quartet, or shimmying in a conga line, weaving in and out of the Mickey Mouse Club marching band, chanting about Ho Chi Minh, maybe wasn't all that remarkable, relatively, after you'd seen an animatronic macaw sing in a French accent in the enchanted tiki room. When the protesters climbed the rigging of Captain Hook's pirate ship and shouted about the war from the crow's nest, most folks barely looked up from their tuna sandwich at the Chicken of the Sea restaurant. Newspaper accounts note that their frustration seemed to grow as the day went on. Some got tired of being called dirty hippies and worse by clean-cut tourists when they were just trying to have a transcendent psychedelic experience in the haunted mansion. Others grumbled that the mass protest had never quite materialized and that their chants and their street theater didn't succeed in opening people's eyes to the grand illusion that was Disneyland, to the phoniness of its bourgeois corporatized pleasures, of its conservative nostalgia, of the prescribed and rule-bound experiences it passes off as adventure, that it was a narcotic that kept people from confronting the horrors of the world. As if those people didn't know. As if being aware of the illusion wasn't the whole point. Visitors rode on a steamboat in a circle in a concrete trench filled with water and called it the Rivers of America. They went from Switzerland to China to Australia, from clocks to noodles to kangaroos, in mere minutes. It was a small world, after all. While clockwork dolls sang that same song of sameness, of disparate lives unified by laughter and tears and hopes and fears. And then they stepped out into the light and saw young people with strange clothes and strange politics. And what's so strange about that? It was 25 years to the day since the United States dropped an atom bomb from a plane over Hiroshima, Japan, and killed 20,000 soldiers and somewhere between 70 and 127,000 civilians. People just going about their day. And that's why the Yippies picked August 6th for their powwow. To protest another war. And tie what was happening in Vietnam to the fit of madness that had birthed the world as it was. The only one they'd ever known. 25 years that may as well have been an eternity. For others, for the middle-aged parents just trying to give their kids a day out. 25 years may as well have been yesterday. Just days before, the U.S. Army gave up on an outpost on a hillside in a valley in Vietnam. After losing a battle, it fought for 23 days straight. 75 young American men died defending fire support base Ripcord. And now about the same number of young Americans stormed Tom Sawyer's Island. They took down the American flag. People on shore over by the line for the Pirates of the Caribbean were outraged when they thought they saw the flag of the Viet Cong rise in its place. It wasn't. It was a yippie flag with a black star and a marijuana leaf. But the newspaper said it was the flag of North Vietnam. And that misidentified flag would stay in their memories and stay at the center of the story of the state of young America that they took home with them that day. Years later, one of the organizers of the powwow told the historian that he had known all along there were never going to be tens of thousands of yippies at the park. Part of the game, part of the provocation, was misdirecting the police, throwing everyone into a panic. It was good to know that they had that much power, at least. And of those three or four hundred kids who came for the happening, maybe half were yippies, were there with an agenda other than having a good time at Disneyland, smoking a bowl and going on the jungle cruise, maybe meeting someone cute and seeing what happened. There were factions, there always are. And there was an attempt to rally everyone on the island, to come up with a strategy and a coherent message, to give the media something for the nightly news before it got too dark for the cameras. But people broke off, 
One group to disrupt a parade. One group to start some trouble at the Bank of America by the fire station. Another to pull down the flag by the entrance. Still others slipped off on their own to disappear into the woods like guerrilla fighters. Or sneak onto balconies of old New Orleans or melt into the secret spaces off the map between the lands. The riot police came back. Some fights broke out. Tellers at the bank hid behind the counters, genuinely terrified. An old woman shouted about how Disneyland wasn't for them. It was only for real Americans, like the people who had gathered in an ad hoc chorus in the platform of the train station to sing God Bless America while fires burned in trash barrels, while short-haired men cold-cocked long-haired men, while other young men and young women skinny-dipped in the fake Missouri or the Mississippi or whatever it was supposed to be and marveled at the stars and just how real everything looked, just how magical it all felt. Some protesters were arrested. Others were ushered through the West Gate while the short-haired patrons were sent out the East and told they could come back for free another time. They just had to tell the lady at the ticket booth they were there the day the Yippies came to Disneyland. The Memory Palace is written and produced by me, Nate DeMeo, with engineering assistance from Elizabeth O'Bear. The show is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, which receives ad-serving technology from AdZerk and listener support from people like you. If you would like to support the show and our collective of independent programs at Radiotopia, visit radiotopia.fm slash donate. I've got one bit of housekeeping I am looking for a part-time research assistant. Uh, This person will be in the greater Los Angeles area. I know that eliminates nearly all of you, but um, I find it's really helpful uh, to be able to communicate and meet up and stuff. The ideal candidate, besides being amazing at this kind of work and kind and cool, has ties to academia. They're a current student or a fellow or a faculty member or a librarian or something or at least still have logins and all the right American history list serves and the like, interlibrary loan privileges and things like that. I know that is a specific ask and it will leave a lot of great people out, but that's what I found works for me. If this is you or someone you know, shoot me an email with a resume at nate at thememorypalace.us. I am a solid A- boss. And before I let you go, I want to tell you about one of the shows that makes me proud to be in Radiotopia. The folks at Radio Diaries have been delivering extraordinary stories about ordinary lives for more than 20 years. They are just about the best at doing this thing that we do here. A few years ago, before I joined the network, I was judging this contest um, in Chicago. It was me and all these other radio and podcast people. It's a fancy group. And we spent a couple of days listening to these fantastic stories from all over the English-speaking world. And the whole time, uh, we're talking about how we want to give the award this year to some up-and-coming talent. That we were going to really shake up the order of things. But by the end of it, it was so clear that once again, Radio Diaries, 20 years into the game, had told the best story, like full stop. They'd done it again. They are infuriatingly good at their jobs. And if you don't know their work, it's time to make Radio Diaries a part of your life. Go to radiotopia.fm and check it and the other radio shows out. Thanks for listening. Radiotopia.